Hello and welcome everyone to this colloquium of the Institute of Ethics in AI on the topic, Why New Realities Demand New Rights. I'm the director of the Institute, John Tesulis. The book that is the basis of our discussion today is The Coming Good Society, Why New Realities Demand New Rights, published by Harvard University Press in 2020. It's written by authors Bill Schultz and Sushma Rahman, who I'm delighted to introduce as our speakers today. Bill Schultz is a Unitarian Universalist minister, a former executive director of Amnesty International USA, a former senior fellow for human rights at the Center for American Progress, and a former president and CEO of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. He taught human rights for several years at NYU and has held appointments at various academic institutions, including the University of Chicago, the Meadville Lombard Theological School, where he is currently um, an affiliate professor. Sushma Rahman is the executive director of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy at Harvard University. She has over two decades of global experience in leading social justice and philanthropic initiatives. She has taught graduate courses in the public policy schools at UCLA, um, University of Southern California, Tufts Fletcher School, and the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. Welcome to you both. Both of our authors have an impressive track record of extensive practical engagement with rights-based issues. But at a more general level, I think we can see their book as responding to a serious theoretical conundrum, one that is the product of a tension between two prominent strands in the discourse of human rights and of rights generally. Though I'm gonna to tend to focus on human rights in this introduction, but the book is broader than human rights because of course it also has within its remit animal rights, robot rights, etc. Now, on the one hand, rights and especially human rights are standardly conceived as grounded in some innate quality of human beings. They are rights we possess simply in virtue of being human because all humans at all times and places possess an inherent dignity. This is a familiar idea, both in the writings of philosophers over the centuries, but also in key human rights instruments, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But if human rights are grounded in immutable features of human nature, doesn't it follow that there is a single, unchanging set of human rights that extends to all times and places? Won't the set of human rights be invariant? But this ahistorical view comes up against another strand in human rights discourse, the fact that rights change over time in response to a changing profile of interests and capabilities. Socioeconomic rights, which had had at best a marginal presence over many centuries, came into prominence with the Universal Declaration. Other rights, such as rights of those with disabilities and to non-discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation, also emerged over time. Today, in the new technological environment, we're witnessing the emergence of rights such as the rights not to be forgot, the rights to be forgotten, to internet access, and to not be subject to certain kinds of automated decisions. As our speakers put it in their book, quote, rights are dynamic, responsive to new circumstances and consciousnesses, and change as our ideas of the good society change, unquote. How then to resolve this tension between a historical grounding and dynamic practical reality. The authors are unequivocal. We have to ditch the longstanding philosophical quest to ground human rights in something purportedly a historical and objective, whether that's human nature, natural law, or any other candidate. Such an enterprise cannot be squared in their view with the evolving character of our human rights discourse. Moreover, the philosophical enterprise faces at least one other problem that I wanna highlight, it cannot really address, say our authors, the skeptics question of why they should accept any particular theorists conception of human nature and the rights that supposedly flow from it, especially since theorists have a pronounced tendency to disagree amongst themselves. In place of the philosophical quest for an ahistorical grounding of rights, our speakers suggest in the spirit of the philosopher Richard Rorty, or in this context, he may be a kind of anti-philosopher, that we should see human rights not as grounded in eternal truths, but in a process of social construction. 
So, in, so this is human rights, as it were, for a post-truth era. We're not grounding human rights in some notion of objective truth, but we're constructing them, we're creating human rights. And human rights are constructed by a process in which a worldwide consensus among governments develops over time on the fundamental requirements of a good society, a consensus that comes to be enshrined in international human rights law. So you can see how social construction helps make sense of the dynamic character of rights. Rights evolve in line with evolution in the global consensus about the basic demands on a good society. And here I'm pretty much focusing on the author's account of human rights. But what about the other problem that beset the philosophical view? The skeptics challenge, which in this case would be to ask, well, why should we accept the products of a global consensus? And here the speakers respond to the skeptic as follows in a very interesting passage. They say this, we don't have to convince them that humans have inherent dignity or are endowed with reason or conscience. That's the old philosophical project that the authors are ditching. We simply say these rights are rights because the international community has recognized them to be integral to the common good, to a good society. Deny them if you like, but if you do, you will be flying in the face of a significant worldwide consensus. So here we hit quite a basic philosophical issue. Are human rights essentially the products of a certain kind of consensus? Or are they, as pre-Copernican obscurantist philosophers like myself believe, standards for criticizing any consensus, no matter how extensive? And I think it's quite interesting in this context both of our speakers are American. If there's one country that has tended to not accord great significance to international consensus about human rights norms or other international legal norms, it is America. So it'd be interesting to see how they respond to that kind of exceptionless skepticism. Now, in the bulk of the book, the authors put their social constructionist view of human rights to work. They put it to work in assessing new directions for rights ranging in their discussion from sex and gender to privacy and corruption and the rights of animals and robots. And today in the talk, Sushma will be focusing, I think, on privacy rights and its implications in the context of new technology. But before turning over to Bill and Sushma, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our two commentators today, uh, who in my view are two of the most interesting and independent-minded people writing about human rights. The first is Guelma Vedarame QC, who is a professor of international law at the Department of War Studies and the Dixon Poon School of Law at King's College London. He's published extensively in the areas of public law, international arbitration, and comparative public law. His article, Rescuing Human Rights from Proportionality, is, I believe, a landmark contribution to the legal theory of human rights that everyone concerned with human rights should read. Our second commentator, is Samuel Moyne, who is the Henry R. Luce Professor of Jurisprudence at Yale Law School and Professor of History at Yale University. Sam is a leading intellectual historian and legal theorist who is currently the Carlisle Lecturer here at Oxford. His lectures entitled The Cold War and the Canon of Liberalism. So that's a plug for you, Sam, but I'm sure you don't really need it. Sam has written a series of widely celebrated books probing the dark sides of human rights and international law, the most recent of which is Humane, How the United States Abandoned Peace and Reinvented War. So thank you so much, Guelmo and Sam. Um, I think I just want to stress to the audience, we're very keen on audience participation. So please use the chat function on YouTube to ask your questions. Um, and then we'll have a chance to put them to the speakers and the commentators at a later stage. But first, I'd like to hand over to Bill, who's gonna kick us off. So Bill, when you're ready, thank you so much. Well, thank you uh, to the Institute and thank you, John, for an excellent uh, posing of the issues in the book. Uh, my comments will be but a mere footnote on your introduction. Uh, I'm going to guess that at one time or another, most of us have either picked a wild flower from a garden or at least enjoy the sight and scent of a bouquet of flowers on a table. Now, picking wildflowers, of course, uh, kills them. And so if I'm right about my assumption uh, 
then almost all of us have been party to the violation of wildflowers' right to life. Now, of course, I know very well that the right of wildflowers not to be arbitrarily killed is not yet an established right, but the point of our new book and my remarks today is that someday it might. I served as head of Amnesty International USA during the time that same-sex marriage was first being recognized by some nations as a human right. And as more and more jurisdictions began to codify the right of LGBTQ plus persons to marry whomever they chose, I began asking myself, did the right to marriage equality exist somehow from the beginning of human history even before anyone had contemplated the idea, or did it emerge gradually as human norms and understanding about LGBTQ persons changed, only to be made official in 2001 when the Netherlands became the first country to recognize marriage equality in law. The common consensus about rights, the common conception of rights, as Professor Tessiulis has said, is that they are indelible characteristics of human beings, such as in my case, gray hair and the tendency to put on weight. Commonly, people will say, I have a right to free speech, as if that is something I possess and always have. But in our book, we argue that rights are based upon human beings' transactions with one another and with the world around us, and that we assign rights rather than discover them based upon our changing conceptions of dignity and our changing notions of what constitutes the good society. Take, for example, emerging rights such as digital rights or the right to control the use of our own genetic code. Those couldn't possibly have existed in an analog age or before the world even knew what a genetic code was, could they? Like LGBTQ rights, those are new rights that are being newly assigned as a result of changing norms, modern technologies, and corresponding social, political, and economic pressure. Now, I realize that this notion of rights as transactional and evolutionary is an uncomfortable one. In a message that Professor Tassoulis sent us a week or so ago, he objected to the notion that rights are either immutable or a matter of choice. I'm going to quote him because he joined the issue so very well. Rights can change, he said, not as a result of choices, but as a result of the evolving moral significance of historical facts. And he went on to offer an analogy. What counts as a good diet for a person changes from babyhood to adulthood, but this is a matter of what is a healthy diet at different stages of life. It's not determined by transactions or decisions. And then he asked us, is it your view that before slavery was illegal, people had no right to be enslaved? No, sorry, no right not to be enslaved. Now, the analogy to diet recommendations illustrates my point quite aptly. I'm not denying the importance of facts. When Georges Clemenceau was asked what historians would say was the cause of World War I, he is said to have replied, I don't know to what they will ascribe the cause, but I do know that they will not say that France invaded Germany. Facts are facts. But some facts change, and even when they don't, how we react to those facts, the choices we make about them, determine our behaviors. When my parents were children, dietitians advised that children be fed as much meat and cream as possible to build strong bones and bodies. Today, we know that was bad advice. Dietetic advice, like rights, evolves, but even well-established facts are easily disputed, as we have seen to our chagrin with max, uh, mask and vaccine mandates. Even true facts entail choices as to how they will affect our behavior. Moreover, rights reflect values, the value of human dignity and the value of living in a good society. So the rights are certainly informed by facts. They are ultimately decided by value choices, not by facts alone. 
the right to be enslaved, sorry, the right not to be enslaved was recognized by many, many people, of course, long before it was legally codified. But until those wise, brave people first conceived that there was something wrong with slavery, and before that norm seized hold of society, the right not to be enslaved had no practical meaning. So what are the implications of this conception of rights for our, for our lives today? Well, first, that previously established rights must be constantly updated or new ones established. And in a moment, Sushma will describe some examples. But if rights describe our relationship to each other and to the world around us, then some entities other than human beings may appropriately be signed rights too. An obvious candidate is animals because as uh, Jeremy Bentham put it, the question is not can animals reason nor can they talk, but can they suffer? Moreover, though they can't talk a language we can understand, they can reason and they can feel jealousy and they can mourn. Now, what all those animal rights should be is still to be determined. Nobody is arguing that ants should have the right to vote or ant eaters the right to an abortion, the right to practice their religion. But then nobody argues that men should have the right to an abortion either. Rights are drawn to suit the characteristics of the rights holder. And in the case of animals, those might include the right to a livable environment or the right to associate with other animals of their species or the right not to be mistreated. The question we can ask ourselves is, what do we want our relationship with animals to be? And how ought that relationship be embodied in a good society? But if we are at least slightly sympathetic to the idea of animal rights, I'll bet we are a lot more skeptical when it comes to the right, uh, rights of robots. Aren't robots just machines that are driven by instructions, algorithms from programmers? They can't reason independently or grieve or empathize or suffer. Am I telling you that my Roomba vacuum cleaner has rights? No, I'm not suggesting that. But there are robots and there are robots. Hitchbot, was an adorable little robot with a face, head, arms, and legs who hitchhiked across Canada, Germany, the Netherlands, and part of the U.S. chatting cheerily with people and dispensing advice until he was beheaded by vandals in Philadelphia and died. Solana is a robot in the shape of a woman, and Henry a bot in the shape of a man who can chat about multiple topics, express emotions, and provide any number of other services a partner might require. These are called social robots. And the question is not whether they have rights, because remember I said humans don't have rights. The question is whether we may want to assign some social robots at least elementary rights, like the right not to be capriciously beheaded by vandals in Philadelphia. Not because the robots need the rights, but because in a future good society, we may not want the human robot relationship to be characterized by wanton destruction of human like creatures. Well, all well and good, I hear you thinking, but still at the end of the day, those robots won't care if they're stomped to death. They're just machines programmed to do what they're told. And that's true of many robots, but there is a whole new class of robots in development that are called deep learning neural networks and are modeled on the human brain. And these robots, analyze enormous quantities of data, recognize patterns, sometimes make autonomous decisions that have not been programmed into them and are beyond human control. And such robots may eventually make independent moral choices, express empathy, act altruistically. And at that point, we will simply need to think long and hard about whether a good society would need to grant the rights before the robots take over and demand rights for themselves. Animal rights, robot rights, what else could there be? Well, the final set of possible rights I'll mention are the rights of nature. <clears throat> you know quite well that in some indigenous cultures, nature, the earth, rocks, water, wind, are regarded as living things. But even if we don't regard these elements of nature as literally living, <clears throat> uh, as literally living, we may want to award them rights to signal the relationship between humans and nature in a good society is one of respect and tenderness. For of course, if nature doesn't thrive or flourish, human beings won't either. <clears throat>
Well, I don't know what the future good society will look like, whether flowers or robots will be able to claim rights. But I do know that if we don't think about future rights, we will not be adequately able to defend our current ones. Rights are interrelated. One of our distinguished respondents, Professor Moyne, as Professor Tassoulis has uh, alluded, has criticized the human rights movement and with some justification for inadequate attention to economic inequality. But we will never overcome such inequality as long as we lack such things as the right to a basic guaranteed annual income or the right of people displaced by climate change to claim protection under the Refugee Convention. Finally, as the renowned law professor Patricia Williams puts it, instead of discarding or limiting rights, society must give them away. Flood society's untouchables with the animating spirit that rights mythology fires in the most oppressed psyches, so that we may say not that we own gold, but that a luminous golden spirit owns us. Thank you. Sushma? Uh, thank you, John, and thank you, Bill, for getting us started with this very thought-provoking um, remarks. I'm Sushma Raman. I'm the Executive Director of the Carr Center at the Kennedy School. It's really an honor and privilege to be with you today. Um, as Bill mentioned, our book uh, outlines the fact that rights are not static, permanent, and perpetual. They don't stay the same from generation to generation. We argue that some rights evolve and change depending on changing norms and circumstances, and sometimes brand new rights arise that few people had contemplated before, and the premise of the book is not uncontroversial. Many academics and advocates, including people we interacted with during um, the writing of this book, will say that in the face of assaults on rights from authoritarians, we should really focus and narrow our focus on the most essential of rights, core rights, such as the right to live free from torture or ground them in something eternal or permanent. And we have argued the opposite because traditional understanding of rights as indestructible have not dissuaded authoritarians from dismantling rights and attacking rights claimants. And every generation has had to grapple with both the expansion of rights to those who have been excluded as well as the rollback of rights by those in power. Um, as John outlined, uh, both Bill and I are practitioners and uh, the New York Review of Books said of Bill that he has done more than anyone in the human rights movement to make human rights known in the United States. Uh, we both met about 15 years ago uh, as judges for the Robert F. Kennedy International Human Rights Award and our experience working both in the field, but also uh, supporting movements, funding movements, um, launching collaboratives. Our experience tells us that human rights organizations and movements are often mired in today's crises. Leaders don't always have the chance to take a breath, look up and look forward to future trends and challenges. At the very same time, the accountability, relevance and legitimacy of the human rights movement and framework are being questioned and attacked by academics um, as well as by uh, elected officials. So we believe our book contributes to a broader public dialogue about the relevance of rights and how they must evolve with changing circumstances in order to remain relevant and effective. So we do argue that to preserve and promote a good society that protects members' dignity and fosters an environment in which people will want to live, we have to think about the meanings of familiar rights, rethink those, and consider the introduction of new rights. We draw in part upon the work of Martha Nussbaum, who champions the capabilities approach, which requires us to focus on the protection of the areas of freedom so central that their removal makes a life not worthy of human dignity. Some of these uh, capabilities that are necessary to a life of dignity include bodily health and integrity, education, ability to participate in political life and more. Now, Bill touched on some of the issues that we address in the book. One of the chapters, Here's Looking at You, addresses the increasing encroachments on our privacy, liberty, and freedoms through technological advancements. 
thanks to the publishing cycle in academia, this chapter was actually written a couple of years prior to publication. And there's been significant acceleration in both technological advancements as well as research in this domain. Nevertheless, as we indicate in the book, our efforts are meant less to predict than to provoke, to encourage collective thinking and discourse on how technology can contribute to the shaping of a good society. We touch on issues of privacy and surveillance, um, made increasingly familiar to us through Shoshana Zuboff's work, for example, on surveillance capitalism, uh, issues of opacity and bias, and online manipulation through effective computing, the use of computing to identify and influence emotions. Um, and we also touch on other issues, such as the fact that people who are already marginalized and discriminated against, ethnic and religious minorities, communities of color, LGBT communities, human rights defenders, are often um, increasingly under scrutiny and surveillance. Now, many of us might be tempted to think that privacy endangerments are limited to tracking of alleged terrorists and criminals, but we are mistaken. Now, many of these controversial and widely publicized threats to privacy were instituted in the context of the war on terror. But increasingly, we find that we are waking up to a range of smart gadgets from our smartphone alarms to our social media feeds that we uh, peruse in the morning, um, the various gadgets at home, as well as in our workplace that we utilize. And through these, a composite digital picture can be created of our likes, dislikes, consumer choices, illnesses, religious romantic preferences, our most private concerns and obsessions. And really this rise of big data, the compilation and analysis of, and commodification of our digital footprints is really one of the most complex and challenging questions of our time. Now we might be tempted to think of the right to privacy as a far less important right than say the right not to be tortured or disappeared or executed extrajudicially. Violations of the latter rights cost you enormous suffering or your life, while infringements on right to privacy feel more like an inconvenience. In fact, when we workshopped our chapters, some people said, well, privacy is a Western obsession or it's really a luxury. But the reality is that violations to privacy often go hand in hand with violations of bodily integrity and uh, violations of other kinds of rights. And these are often the uh, canary in the mine shaft that signal violations of other rights of a more serious nature. Uh, we are increasingly seeing the use of facial recognition software, for example, in everything from um, policing to um, you know, possibly in the future, the use of billboards that will reflect um, ads that show the composites of faces of our friends to encourage us to buy more products the criminal justice system, the immigration system, numerous uh, welfare systems uh, rely on these systems. Um, uh, and, and, and increasingly in many countries around the world, governments are systematically tracking protests, outrage, and muzzling the freedom of speech and expression of human rights activists, journalists, and others um, you know, using uh, now it's the pandemic, but oftentimes it's uh, issues of um, you know, national security, other reasons to really uh, stifle civic association and assembly. Now the coronavirus pandemic uh, has only intensified this issue around the world. And yes, the book did come out uh, in 2020, uh, but I think it did foreshadow some of the uses of surveillance um, by governments around the world to track individuals' physical locations and contacts. And the reality is that in many places, these temporary powers will eventually become permanent. So, um, you know, while this right to privacy might be considered a well-established right, we may want to think about how we exercise these rights in, in this new landscape. Activists in the US, for example, have been working on a ban or moratorium on the use of facial recognition technology, while human rights groups around the world are protesting the use of surveillance by digital authoritarians. Um, people in the, uh, in the EU, for example, have talked about the right to be forgotten. There's the question of, is there a right to explanation in the case of opacity and bias affecting automated decision-making systems and the use of uh, predictive an analytics? So, you know, there's a lot of lot more issues around human rights in the digital age. We could spend many days discussing these issues, and these are definitely one set of concerns 
facing communities and societies around the world. And I'll just flag one other issues that we cover in our book, which is really the issue of economic rights in an age of accelerating inequality. And human rights are often seen as comprising civil political rights, such as the right to vote, and then economic, social, cultural rights, such as the right to food. And human rights organizations in the global north are often accused of focusing much more on civil political rights than economic rights. In many countries in the global south, community organizations and movements for social change and uh, human rights, in their context, the quest for economic rights and political civil rights are indivisible and um, deeply, deeply connected. One new right that we propose in the book, the right to live free from corruption, could make a significant difference, we argue, in the ability of communities around the world to strengthen economic rights and possibly a range of other rights. Um, the reality is that you know, there are millions, hundreds of millions of people around the world living in extreme poverty, and they are deeply affected by both petty corruption as well as grand corruption. A petty corruption is, um, you know, the sort of day-to-day -day abuse of power by low and mid-level public officials, while grand corruption is really corruption that exists at the highest levels of government. And what's interesting is that far from the poor being a drain on public resources, petty corruption actually results in the poor paying excessively for basic goods and services that the rich and middle class take for granted. And in the case of uh, grand corruption, it really affects the poor more so than the rich, we argue, because it limits the ability of uh, low-income communities and marginalized communities to exercise and achieve a range of rights and to realize their full uh, human dignity. It reduces the ability of the state to spend revenues on basic needs of citizens, um, the sources of illicit money are sometimes tied to illicit activities, uh, which are detrimental to the rights of vulnerable people, activities such as narco trafficking. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, the corrupt design of institutions, laws, policies, and information exchange benefits the powerful at the expense of those who lack power. Now, international law does not currently consider corruption per se a violation of human rights even though the former UN um, HCR uh, commissioner, human rights commissioner, Navi Pillai, former UN secretary general, Kofi Annan, and others have underscored the corrosive effect of corruption on societies. Uh, the UDHR, the international covenants don't mention the word corruption. And we do support this formal establishment of a right to live in a corruption-free society. We believe it's important to recognize it as a right, not just as a nice idea or a public policy, because it signals the establishment of a globally recognized norm that cannot be dismissed as a do-gooders conception of best practice. It's a feature of human dignity and the good society sanctioned by the world community. And it allows people around the world to ensure that governments and corporations can be held accountable. It facilitates appeals to UN bodies and international courts. And it really ensures that um, in living in a corruption-free society as a human right will ensure that other rights can be accessed and availed of as well. Um, so the book uh, covers a range of topics which are not meant to be comprehensive or complete in terms of an analysis of all of the um, emerging issues upon us. And as I mentioned before, it is designed less to predict than to provoke. And our hope is that really this draws people into conversation and into reflection and action. Um, and I'd like to just close with reflecting on a couple of trends that have taken place since the book was published, which is that um, you know we've been in the middle of a pandemic for the past two years. During this time, the wealth of billionaires, uh, technology billionaires has dramatically increased while millions of people around the world have lost their jobs. Um, and uh, protests against racial violence in the United States have um, you know, expanded and there are increasing demands and an increasing sense of urgency around the role of rights. And so what we believe is that um, those issues are very, very important to address. Uh, and uh, simultaneously, we need to think about how those issues intersect with and complement and sometimes um, you know, might conflict with some of these long-term issues uh, that we have outlined in this book.
So I'll close there. Actually, I'll just add one thing, which is this issue of American exceptionalism. And maybe we'll come to that in the Q&A. I was born and raised in India. I've lived in the United States uh, for many years now, but my work has been primarily global in nature. And, um, you know, I'd like to think that there are ways in which we could think of human rights and the quest for justice as really a global endeavor where we can uh, learn from those who often are closest to the issues and who are doing amazing work uh, around the world. So thank you, John. Thank you so much, Bill and Sushma. That was a really inspiring presentation of the basic ideas underlying your important book. I'm really um, pleased now to turn over to our first commentator, who is Guelma Vedaraman. When you're ready, Guelma. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you, Bill and uh, uh, Sushma, Sushma again for uh, for your book, which I very much enjoyed uh, enjoyed reading, and to John for the opportunity to uh, uh, to comment on it. Um, I don't think I found myself in disagreement with um, uh, the importance of pretty much any of the challenges uh, to human rights that you identify in the book uh, and discuss. There are quite a different uh, group of challenges. Some of them derive from technological developments, big data, artificial intelligence, biosciences. Others derive from political or social developments, such as uh, transnational corruption, and, and, and Sushma was just touching on it now. Um, where I do struggle a bit is with the proposition that each of these new challenges uh, has to require the generation of a new right, because I think what we are dealing with is actually a, a host of different situations and interactions between reality and rights. Um, first of all, I think we, we, we sort of have to be clear on what we mean by new rights. Do we mean new rights based on moral values and moral ideas that we haven't yet discovered, or perhaps we've only impartially or imperfectly discovered. Uh, I think many of the moral values and the rights predicated on those values that uh, you discuss in your book uh, and that you seek to protect from these new challenges are not new. Uh, the value of equality and the rights to equality and non-discrimination, uh, which are behind uh, many of your concerns, particularly in the second chapter of the book, are obviously not new moral ideas nor is the moral idea of a private sphere and the moral value of individual autonomy and choice and the right to privacy in family life that serve those moral values uh, and new. Uh, animal rights, I think, are in a different category because they evidently do rest on moral values that are different from those that have underpinned uh, the development of human rights. But I think there is an important difference uh, here between uh, new sets of moral values and moral rights that we, we need to develop and, and existing moral values and moral rights and legal rights, to which I will come in a second, that we need to, as it were, perhaps upgrade in some ways. Um, I think the second uh, point is to distinguish situations where uh, we are um, uh, simply applying new rights to new facts or new circumstances, because this is just the process of, uh, of law. Uh, some new facts uh, may uh, be so unusual that they may call for, for new specific legal rights, but not because a new moral right is somehow engaged, but simply because the universe of the existing legal rights is inadequate. And I think that's where your, your, your analysis of the way in which technologies impact privacy uh, is, is relevant. The human right to privacy and the moral concerns behind uh, that human right remains the sort of moral and legal umbrella that, that captures uh, your concerns. But it may well be, and I agree with you, that we need specific new legal instruments, some of which may be specific rights to protect individuals' privacy interests in certain contexts and in certain social interactions on the web, et cetera. Um, I think the third and perhaps the most difficult uh, situation is the relationship between human rights and social practices. Uh, and this is really part of that complex relationship between Morris uh, and morality. Uh, social practices, identities, they, they play a role in shaping the content of both moral and legal right. And I think same-sex marriage, uh, on which Bill you touched, is, is an excellent illustration of that. Is this a new human right? Or is it a modern extension, a modern application of the old human right to equality and non-discrimination? You, you note in the book that Eleanor Roosevelt uh, 
who is believed to have had a same-sex relationship would have probably had very little sympathy uh, for the idea of same-sex marriage. Uh, but she was certainly an egalitarian and she certainly believed in equality. Uh, I remember probably the first debate I heard on this topic in the 1990s in Italy, uh, where this um, uh, gay rights activist of the Pasolini generation reacted with utter disdain to the idea that he had any interest in supporting same-sex marriage. Same -sex marriage. Uh, you can keep your Catholic bourgeois marriage and the hypocrisy that comes with it, was his reaction. Um, now, this man was an egalitarian, like Pasolini, he was a convinced egalitarian. Um, but the point is that egalitarians of Roosevelt's generation, of Pasolini's generation, uh, lived their sexual and sentimental life differently, and they also thought of marriage differently. Marriage has changed. Uh, quite a lot as a social institution. It is now predominantly a secular and civil law institution in our societies rather than a religious institution. And that's why exclusion from it has come to be viewed and to matter to the life and to experience of people in a different way. So as our social identities and our social practices evolve and the social institutions and arrangements change, the way in which the moral idea of equality and the right to equality is instantiated uh, changes too. And perhaps robots come into play here as well. And I very much like the example that uh, uh, Bill, you were, you were giving of uh, uh, individuals develop, developing an attachment to robots. Uh, and there seems to be a trend in a lot of societies of individuals, particularly younger individuals, uh, establishing sentimental and even sexual attachments to robots. Now, even if the robot doesn't have a right per se, and we haven't certainly come to that at this stage, the human being that develops this kind of attachment to the robot may be entitled to some kind of protection under old moral ideas of, of, of again, privacy and, 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 and even family life. But um, the, the fourth uh, point is the relationship, again, very complicated between moral and legal rights. Uh, there are some good reasons why legal rights both international or domestic legal rights are sometimes more extensive than moral rights and sometimes less extensive than moral rights. Now, new developments in technology may require a shifting uh, of those boundaries. And I think free speech is a very good example. Uh, there are jurisdictions, the United States, for example, where uh, the approach to free speech, as we know, is governed by the First Amendment and where even extreme forms of hate speech or Holocaust denial are considered protected speech. Uh, this is not how other jurisdictions uh, protect free speech, but there are places where free speech is protected in, in this way. Um, I don't think that even the most enthusiastic supporter of the First Amendment approach to free speech ever considered that there is a moral entitlement uh, to tell lies about history, to tell lies about the Holocaust, or to, 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 to spread hateful speech. Uh, the reasons why they thought the legal right had to be configured in that way had to do with other considerations, making sure that uh, the government wasn't given the power to censor, which the government could abuse, or perhaps even the consideration that the truth uh, is more likely to flourish if lies are challenged by argument in the public sphere rather than suppressed, etc. Now, those reasons that justified, according to some, that particular approach to free speech are now put to the test by what um, you describe in your book, the technologies of manipulation are far more effective than they were before, fake news going viral, and etc. So even in societies that were confident uh, about the uh, antibodies that they had against such extremist speech, concerns are quite widely emerging about the sustainability of democratic institutions faced with this kind of phenomenon, whether it is still appropriate to, to, to create a legal right of free speech that goes as far as it does, as it does there. But what these developments may call for in these cases, it's not necessarily a new uh, right in a moral sense, but a reconsideration of the content of legal rights and, and of the way in which legal rights can instrumentally promote certain, certain moral values. And, and finally, and I conclude with this, I think corruption may also fit into the picture here. Uh, is it uh, really necessary to give uh, the uh, uh, protection of the crucial moral and political values of, of, of life in a corruption-free society to give it a, a, a human right content? There are other ways in which 
the law can seek to prom promote that uh, that important central value of, po of political morality, and to a large extent, international law is already is already doing that. You know, treaties on transnational crime, the creation of new criminal offences, etc. Do we really need the legal human right to live in a corruption-free state, and don't we instead need to strengthen other mechanisms other than legal rights that the law offers for promoting this very important uh, moral and political interest? I think I've taken a couple of minutes longer. Sorry, John. Well, that's valuable QC time, so we're not going to complain about that, Guelma. Sam, pass on to you. It's okay, because I can retroactively cede two of my minutes. Uh, I just want to begin by congratulating Bill and Sushma. Um, I'm going to ask four questions that are brief. Um, you know, partly because I I was added late and I looked at the book when it came out, but not in recent days um, when I couldn't get hold of it on a trip. Um, so the first question kind of is incited by our philosopher friends who are pressing you on how new new rights are, given that morality is eternal in their view. Um, and I, I'm just curious, um, do you need to antagonize them to make the rest of your arguments? Uh, maybe it doesn't matter much uh, whether we provide a knockdown case that rights are invented rather than discovered uh, or that they press us, uh, you know, and claim that we're relativists if we don't uh, acknowledge that ultimately morality was always there. Uh, because in the end, they're conceding that new rights need to be coined. Maybe uh, uh, in recognition of a prior morality, or maybe as specifications of old rights, but is 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 a lot at stake in that debate, in your view, or not? Second, um, how do you think about let's call it the deletion of rights or the obsolescence of rights? Um, it's like the obverse of what you've been thinking about. You know, Bill's opening statement gave a kind of image of, of accumulation that you can only add and never subtract. But, you know, to take John's example, if there always was or whether there always was a right not to be held in servitude, for most of history, a, a lot of people believe they had something like a human right to own other human beings. Um, and that had to be deleted. More generally, you might argue that the right to private property uh, over non-human things is on the wane, and and you 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 could you could you know cite as evidence that the the covenants um, which are unprecedented in the history of rights declarations and not naming a right to private property. So I'm I'm curious then as my second question whether you think new rights could also lead us to back a kind of you know rights that are in, in flux and also um, allow us to drop um, old rights, not just supplement them. Um, third, I, I just can't recall, but it seems like you must have views about these, these two long running debates about proliferation and quality control, which are slightly different. The proliferation debate, as you know, worries about too many rights, which new rights would implicate you know, the concern usually being that with more rights come more conflicts between and amongst rights, or that the space, the legitimate space of discretion is squeezed or infringed by proliferation. Quality control is somewhat different because uh, you might have a concern about the, the quality of rights, um, no matter how many get, you know, invented uh, and, and the concern there is that we, we really want to have a high threshold over what's going to count as a right. And we want to make sure that any newly proposed right, um, you know, really counts. And that was Philip Alston's view many years ago. And, and maybe in a way, John Rawls had a quality con control concern of that kind. And I just, do you care about that, the, these two debates or um, what? what I mean, how would you how would you face them? But my concern, I mean, is in the fourth question is really more political. Is introducing new rights a good political strategy? Um, so, if the view is that uh, uh, new rights are are legitimate because 
they register a mergent or extant consensus. Maybe, you know, in light of new, you know, contexts, uh, maybe as, as specifications of, you know, older, older moral norms or, or old rights. Um, it, 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 I, I, I don't think that fits with what, what the actual practice of a declaring new rights is. Probably there are cases in which finding uh, new rights is, is registering consensus. But I think often for activists, it's a political strategy of anticipating a desired new consensus that doesn't yet exist. Uh, and if that's true, especially with, with respect to pretty much all the new rights you're supporting, um, then the, the real question, the, I think the important question, if you know, the political question is, does calling your priority a right make a political difference? Uh, it's one thing to anticipate a consensus that you desire, but it's another to build it. And there's just an empirical question, does calling your priority a right build more consensus than already exists? And if not, what does? Uh, if it's true, as we've seen in our world, that um, declaring rights is often about process, especially transferring authority to different decision makers, like judges, that could as easily uh, antagonize or alienate as build you know, broader consensus. And so what I basically want to ask, my most important question is, um, why, why should we think that um, naming our priorities as rights will get them recognized and vindicated uh, rather than not, rather than, uh, rather than the reverse? Congratulations and thanks. Thanks so much, Sam. Um, and thanks, Gomer. Two excellent sets of comments there. A lot of um, issues raised. I don't think it's going to be feasible to address probably all of those. So feel free, uh, Bill and Sushma, to select some of those points for response. And who would like to go first? Well, let me uh, thank you to both of you. You've both uh, pinpointed very critical questions. So yes, let me just try to respond briefly to a few of them. <clears throat> first of all, um, it's certainly true that uh, not all of these changes manifest in the form of new rights, as Guglielmo has, has articulated. And I think that the example of marriage equality or same-sex marriage, as opposed to the right to transition from one gender identity to another, are examples of the first is simply an elaboration on the established right to marry, which is even mentioned in the UDHR, the second, I think, is in, in a fair sense, a new right. Now, to take uh, Professor Moyne's last question and relate it to this issue, when something is established as a right, it is far more difficult to reverse than if it is established as simply a law or a policy. And I think, Professor, both of you are correct that ultimately these are often political decisions as to what is possible and what will most effectively establish our political agenda for generations to come. When I talk with many advocates, for example, of LGBTQ rights, all of them wanted a new treaty, an international covenant on this issue. And virtually none of them thought it was the right time politically to try to get it. And they feared that it would result, in fact, in a reversal of rights. So yes, this is indeed ultimately a, a, uh, a political decision in, in many cases. Now, let me just say a word about a couple of other Professor Moyne's provocative questions. First, uh, do we need to offend those who take a, a position of uh, closer to that of immutability of rights. Well, at the end of the day, I don't care how you get to a new right if I agree with that right. Uh, it doesn't matter to me what your philosophical position is unless or until you start claiming that because of the immutability of rights, some large category of people don't deserve new rights. And the best example of that is uh, that I often refer to is uh, when Hillary Clinton went to the Beijing Women's Conference and declared that women's rights are human rights, uh, 
Uh, that was a radical statement 20, 20 or 25 years ago. And many people said, women don't have any rights that are uniquely attached to being a woman. Let's just, re re let's just rely upon our already established rights. And we don't need to create new categories of rights holders. And that's where the rubber meets the road, I think as to the question of whether or not we need to offend those who take immutability. Are they nice immutabilists or are they nasty ones? And that uh, is at the end of the day, part of the political question, I think. Very interesting question about the obsolescence of rights with a transactional understanding and evolutionary understanding of rights. Then the answer to the question is, can rights be deleted? Has to be yes, they can be. Now, sometimes the deletion of rights or deletion of rights we really care about, and we're seeing that all around the world with the challenges to democracy, for example, and we have to fight hard against their deletion. But yes, I can certainly imagine a time when the right to private property, for example, might at least be significantly modified. Uh, and finally, let me speak to this question of proliferation, and then uh, Sushma will respond as she wishes. Uh, my concern with the objection about the proliferation of rights is that we hear this and have heard this historically. Whenever a new set of rights, particularly a set of rights that is attached to a group of people that have not traditionally been awarded rights or assigned rights are, are proposed. And this is where the problem or the objection of proliferation is, is potentially very damaging. Again, this, is, this was the objection when women's rights emerged. This was the objection when the rights of migrants emerged. This was the objection certainly around LGBTQ rights. And it may well be the objection to many of the other rights. And given the interrelationship of rights, I think it is critical to understand that if we are to defend, as I said in my remarks, if we defend many of our current well-established rights, we will only be able to do so by proliferating rights that expand upon and protect those well-established rights. Sushma, would you like to respond to some of the- Yeah, points? there's so much to say, but I'm sure there's gonna be great questions from the audience. So I'll be very brief. I've taken copious notes here. So, <clears throat> you know, I'm thinking about this from the perspective of someone who's been largely a practitioner and where does change come from? And change can come from the top, you know, institutions of global governance, the United Nations, um, you know, uh, the International Criminal Court. But you look at these, this landscape, this global landscape, and uh, there are significant challenges. And then change can also come from the ground. And that's the work that I'm much more familiar with. But there's also challenges there. You have issues of closing civic space around the world. Um, challenges of crackdowns on, you know, freedom of expression and assembly, and um, also the, the funding models for human rights, which are grounded really in sort of very neoliberal approaches. So there are significant challenges in, in, in different spheres in terms of how we think about the relevance of rights and where they are going in the future. So my perspective would be that rather than saying that these are fixed or grounded in X, and we can't expand to why, or um, there are too many rights if we expand. And I agree with Bill. In fact, we heard many of these arguments from people, primarily in academia, and uh, some folks who came from international law who saw it in a very narrow way. And so, you know, I think that rights come from the perspectives of people who have been most disenfranchised, most marginalized, most affected by violations of rights whether by state actors or increasingly by non-state actors, right? Corporations, paramilitaries, et cetera. And so from their perspectives, what does the future of rights look like? And if we see on the ground, um, despite significant crackdowns, we are seeing, for example, Black Lives Matter movements in the United States that are rallying around issues of facial recognition technology being used in surveillance at protests, as well as the increased use of military technologies and policing in communities where basic social and educational services have been hollowed out. We're seeing in countries around the world, from India to Brazil to the Philippines, people talking about ways in which they can secure their rights. And so I would say we listen to the folks on the ground and they are the ones to really construct this architecture. And as Bill said, to determine 
when is the time right for a political strategy and when is it not the right time in order to ensure that um, you know these um, these efforts are successful you know I think um, since the book has written some of my perspectives have evolved and changed and I will say that right now there are like three thoughts that are emerging to me one is sort of definitely the issue of economic inequality within and across countries and looking at that sort of you know, sort of justice versus rights, right? Like economic justice um, versus the rights model. The second is issues of racial discrimination, which have not been adequately addressed both in the global North, but also uh, countries around the world where there's different patterns of marginalization and exclusion. And um, finally, I would say, you know, these sort of uh, digital age era questions, which are now exacerbating and amplifying existing inequalities. And uh, so it's really incumbent upon us to be open, to always be asking the right questions and to be listening to uh, diverse stakeholders as we think about how to frame the relevance and you know, future of rights. Thank you so much. So um, before we go on to um, further questions, can I just sort of intervene a little bit with a couple of thoughts. So one, picking up on Sam's point about the deletion of rights. So, you know, if the rights are going to change, it's not just that we add rights, it could be that we lose rights. And I'm just wondering how you would explain that process. So one example, I think, comes from Richard Rorty. So Rorty said, if climate change continues in the way that it's going, the whole idea of a right to an adequate standard of living might simply go by the board, because Ought implies can, rights involve duties, but if you actually cannot in any way feasibly secure adequate standard of living for people across the globe, it makes no sense to call that a human right. Perhaps we'd have to replace that with a right to subsistence or something less demanding. And that to me sounds like a perfectly reasonable argument that what rights we have in terms of um, standard of living have to be dependent upon what's feasible to deliver. But what about this other case, um, right to gender equality? What if it turns out that there is great take up of authoritarian right-wing sexist movements in coming decades? And increasingly there are populations in countries that are resistant to the whole idea of gender equality. That in fact, exit from treaties that uphold gender equality. It looks to me that on your theory, you're gonna to have to say women no longer have a right to gender equality because the consensus that was needed for that right to exist no longer exists. So I guess what I wanna say is I'm with Rorty on the first kind of change. They're just facts about whether the right is feasible. But I don't think whether women have a right to gender equality depends upon whether lots of people across the world agree to that. There may be various processes where for you know, benighted sorts of reasons, they come to be incredibly hostile to it. So yes, to change, but for the right reasons, the right kind of change. So that's one point I wanted to raise. The second one, Bill, goes back to something you said. So I was giving you the old softball philosophy question. What about you know slavery in the antebellum South? Didn't those slaves have a right not to be enslaved? And you said, well, what is the practical meaning of that? if it wasn't enshrined in law. And what I would say to you is, well, it has lots of meaning. One, the slave understands the wrong that's being done to them. The slaveholder has a moral duty to desist from being a slaveholder. There are good reasons for the rest of society to move to a situation whereby slavery no longer exists, is abolished and so forth. So there are all these sorts of reasons. So I'm gonna say it has tremendous meaning, quite independently of whether it's legally enshrined. Now contrast another right that is legally enshrined, the right, to an, the right to the highest attainable standard of health. Now that's a right that everyone in the world has apparently. Now what's its meaning for those many millions who die from preventable illnesses every year? So what's the kind of meaning that's necessary for it to count as a right? Why have you privileged the legalistic meaning of it? It's present in the law over other kinds of meaning. So John, let me try to respond briefly. I, it's a, you, first of all, you certainly have identified 
a weakness and, and acknowledge weakness in constructivist arguments in terms of the potential for reversal. The problem is that that can also take place if you ground rights in natural law or in a conception of deity. That doesn't guarantee that there isn't going to be a reversal of rights. And given that rights are established, at least human, human rights are established at the international level, the protection that is provided for by the creation of international treaties and what would go into a reversal of that, which would require one country after another to somehow withdraw its ratification of those treaties, that is a pretty complex and demanding thing. Could it happen? Yes, but it hasn't happened yet, at least uh, since 1948. So yes, and of course, they, these rights are often violated. I understand all that, but it's, I think, far harder to reverse those well-established rights if they are based in a constructivist approach than it is if you're simply arguing about what the nature of natural law of human beings is. Let me respond then to your second point, again, a, a good point. Uh, of course, until the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862 and the illegal establishment, uh, that was what was a key factor for many reasons, not just uh, in terms of the slaves, but in terms of the sympathies of Europe uh, with regard to the uh, uh, the em emancipation or the or the acknowledgement that there was no right to enslave people, but I'm not arguing that there that that earlier than 1862, I'm not arguing that there weren't well recognized rights. After all, slavery was abolished. Correct me if I'm wrong. In in the U in UK in 1833, I believe. Uh, and there was growing international consensus long before 1862 that, that, that slavery was a violation of human rights. In fact, I would go back to whatever the earliest abolitionist was. I don't know who that was, but when that first person stood up and said, you know, there's something wrong with the enslavement of human beings, that was the beginning, in my view, and in a constructivist view, that was the very beginning, the nascent point at which that right began to emerge. Uh, so I'm not saying that the right didn't exist before 1862 in the antebellum South, uh, but it wasn't, and, and I, it was important. But if no one before 1862 had even had the idea that there should be an end to slavery, I think we would have, I don't think it would have existed. I think there had to be some initial propulsion of that idea from somewhere. Sushma? Yeah, so, um, you know, just reflecting on your question on the deletion of rights, and ideally we would be in a situation where uh, we have improved as, as societies around the world where that particular right is no longer one that's even relevant. In a different context altogether, you know, we can think about diseases, right, that people had maybe uh, 100 years ago and that perhaps are either eradicated or far less prevalent today. And uh, so in the same way, we might think of uh, certain human rights violations as a thing of the past and no longer in the present. And we're not there yet. With respect to the issue of right to adequate standard of living and whether that needs to be in some way modified in the face of climate change, I'd like to hearken back to Philip Alston, who talks about tax justice as a human rights issue. And the reality is you have global corporations, particularly technology corporations and billionaires who are not paying their fair share of taxes. And um, yes, climate change is wreaking havoc on the lives of vulnerable people around the world who largely were not initially responsible for many of the environmental issues that we are facing today. And so if we approach this from a rights and justice perspective, we would say that uh, we need to ensure right to adequate standard of living and more um, and think about it perhaps within the framework of um, tax as a human rights issue. Um, I, yeah, maybe I'll just stop there because uh, just in the interest of time and see if there's other questions. <laughs>
Okay, so I'm just going to foreshadow that we'll we'll end at 6.30 because this is proving a very rich discussion and I don't want to sort of curtail it too soon. Let me um, go to some questions from the audience. So this is a, a kind of um, double-decker question from Kyle Van Oostrum. Um, he says quite, kind of generally, could we argue that the old rights just need bolstering? Perhaps what we need to do is strengthen the institutions that aim to fulfill the duties, i.e. tackle corruption associated with those rights. And then more specifically, does a new right against corruption meaningfully add to the civil and political rights people already possess? Don't those old rights already ground the duties we bear to tackle corruption? I'll let Sushma take that one. <laughs> sure. So, uh, you know, we do argue uh, that we think about corruption in this rights framework. And I think it is, there is a benefit to that. So if you have the, you know, a chance to read the chapter, I'd suggest doing that. Um, because, you know, we've looked at it through an economic lens, we've looked at it through a financial lens, through a public health lens. And, um, you know, for a very long time, corruption was seen as the cost of doing business around the world. And then it became seen in um, the context of, you know, development organizations and multilaterals who were concerned about sort of their returns on investment and so on. And uh, many of those lenses did not integrate the impact of corruption on the extreme poor. And these are also the people whose rights are being violated by corrupt institutions as well as corrupt public officials. So that is why I think a human rights lens can be helpful when tackling corruption. And we do outline uh, several ways in which uh, this could be beneficial in terms of ensuring that revenues that are garnered are then expended on public goods and services and on strengthening the integrity of uh, state institutions. Before I ask the commentators for their views on corruption as a human right, um, let me ask this question. Um, your approach to human rights, or to rights, is to say, look, you've got to think about the elements of a good society. So that's the fundamental question. But I think you also say in the book that not everything in a good society counts as a right. So for example, maybe a good society, people are very kind and considerate and compassionate. Maybe they have a, a vibrant sporting culture. You know, maybe they have a vibrant literary culture, but not all of this is a matter of rights. So what's gonna be the significance of saying that it's rights? I mean, obviously I've got the point that it formally becomes a right if it's enshrined in this international consensus or a human right. But how do you differentiate? How should we differentiate? When we're activists pressing the case for something, an element of the good society to be recognized as a right, how do we pick out those elements that qualify as such from other elements like say it's mercy or compassion or kindness or something else, avoidance of cruelty, Right, because you could imagine with your animal rights example, a lot of people say, look, you don't need to talk about animal rights. So my, my mentor, Jim Griffin, would say, you don't need to talk about animal rights. Avoidance of cruelty to animals will get you what you need. You don't have to assimilate it to the category of rights. So that's the question I guess I'm asking you. How do we differentiate from within the array of aspects of a good society, those that are or should be rights? So... As a constructivist, I would say we differentiate based upon the groundswell of support for something, as Sushma said, usually from the grassroots level, that gradually accretes more and more support and recognition from the grassroots to the middle roots to the decision makers and eventually is codified. There are, are there things that aren't right? Of course, for, give me, let me give you an example. Is there a right to live a meaningful life? Uh, I, I don't think so. I mean, there's no way to... to... Bill, 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 can I just interrupt? That's the, that's, that's the question. What is the content of your I don't think so? So what, what's the reason you would well, give for saying that is not a right? I, because I don't think ultimately that can be codified or required. And, and I don't think ultimately it is, it is derived from a government action or the action of those who possess various forms of power that are controlled by rights. Uh, rights obviously have to be enforced by someone. Usually that's a governmental entity, but more and more it is also, as Sushma said, 
uh, non-state actors like corporations. And I don't think any of those entities have within them the power to grant someone, to grant me or you, John, a meaningful life. But, but let's, let's take the comparison of health. So the right to the highest attainable standard of health is not a right to actually have that standard because of course I might decide to smoke or not do any exercise, et cetera. And so I won't be healthy, even though the government is doing all it reasonably can to furnish me with the conditions for the highest attainable standard of health. So equally, you might say, look, it's not enough to talk about an adequate standard of living. People need to have a really meaningful life. And what the government has is a duty to enable them not just to have adequacy, but a truly meaningful, flourishing existence. All right, but there, there certainly are some, some basic elements or foundation stones for a meaningful life. Obviously, if you're starving, it's very difficult to attend to your spiritual needs or your, or your needs for meaning. So I don't dispute, just as with health, that there are some basic ground level foundational uh, rights that exist in order to have a meaningful life. But just as you can't require someone to have good health, as you've just said, you can't require them to move on from those foundations foundations to whatever it is they might see as a meaningful life. You can't codify that or demand it uh, in any meaningful way that I can see, at least. Maybe my vision is too limited. So let me pass on now to the commentators if they want to pick up anything that's been said about corruption or the point that Bill has just made. Um, just one point that is very much linked with corruption and also linked with the discussion that we had before. Proliferation of rights. I've got nothing against the proliferation of rights, but it's the proliferation of human rights that I'm a bit skeptical of. And we have to, it seems to me that we need to distinguish the two. Uh, laws create rights all the time. The Palermo Convention on Transnational uh, uh, Corruption creates rights, but they're not human rights. Bilateral investment treaties creates rights, very important rights, by the way, that investors have to sue states where they make foreign investments. They're incredibly important and economically powerful rights, but none of us think of them as human rights. So are we just talking about proliferating new rights? Because I think there are very good reasons why we need treaties that provide for different uh, rights for victims of corruption, et cetera, in particular contexts, et cetera, et cetera, or you know, domestic laws. But the creation of a new human right, uh, I always thought of as a different kind of exercise. I mean, I think Sam spoke of uh, quality control. Now, is this a moral quality control, a political quality control, a legal quality control, all of the above? But uh, I don't think anyone is opposed in principle to some of these problems requiring the establishment of new rights in domestic or international laws. But new human rights is, I think, the issue. And that's where, including on the question of corruption, I remain a bit of a skeptic because I look at the Palermo Convention and all of these instruments that we have, and I'm thinking, what else do we need? We can uh, put people in prison for very long periods of time. We have all sorts of provisions of mutual legal assistance. We have provisions on the confiscation of the proceeds of crime that have to be used in a certain way. What else do we need? And what would the human right to live in a corruption-free society uh, give us in the pursuit of that uh, social and political goal that what we already have doesn't already give us? So that's where my skepticism comes from. Sushma, you've got your hand up. You want to come in? Yeah, you know, this was another point that was raised earlier by Sam and that we've been touching on, which is the, that sort of dual tension between the there's the proliferation debate and the quality control debate. And I just wanted to add there's one other trend that is taking place now in the United States, but also around the world, which is the sort of appropriation of the rights language by people who are anti-rights to advance certain agendas. So in the United States, people might say, I have the right not to wear a mask or I have the freedom uh, to do certain things, right? Um, I, I don't want my bodily integrity affected by a vaccine. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a rights language that's being used um, in a, an anti-rights context. And that is happening also around the world as you look at nationalists who are talking about um, sovereignty, national sovereignty, and rights in the context of national sovereignty to ensure that their rights are not infringed upon by, you know, Western powers or NGOs or whatever. So, you know, I, I do think we need to think about that conversation as well that's occurring around the hijacking of rights that's happening and how to ensure that we 
reclaim rights um, for people who are actually concerned about rights. Sushma, can I just ask you, what makes that, um, you said anti-rights movement, right? Because they, they clearly, there's no reason to doubt their sincerity that they think they have a right not to be vaccinated and so forth or to go about without a mask. So why is this an anti-rights movement? I think Sam wanted- Well, no, I just, I actually want to strengthen the question because it seems like it's, since I'm also a constructivist, I just, I think we have to acknowledge that there's, there's this difficulty in that kind of view, which is that, you know, human rights are up for grabs. And if they're a, mat a matter of emergent consensus, then we can't just dismiss out of hand our enemies rights claims because they might win. And, you know, there, there, there was the Donald Trump commission and there are the Tories uh, who are, you know, I, I haven't followed it in detail, but proposing to repeal the Human Rights Act for the sake of a British Bill of Rights, et cetera. And so the distinction between construction and hijacking is it's extremely difficult to defend. And yet I think you have to or give it up. The British Bill of Rights will include a right to party, Sam. That will be a new right that we're introducing. <laughs> They're construct. They're constructivists. So, so it's just. Well, did you want to respond to that? You know, um, I, I will just say that you know we are. Uh, you know, both several of you have alluded to this that we are talking about rights in a particular political environment, and the environment we are in is one um, with which is tinged with a racial violence, with sort of a hearkening back to a past, uh, a mythical past. And this is not unlike what is happening in other countries as well. You know, if you look at Hungary and so on. And so I do think that in order for human rights to be relevant, we have to say, it's not that we're saying that people who we oppose don't have rights. It's that um, we need to ensure that the people who are most uh, victimized, marginalized, that their rights, their dignity are protected in our efforts. And so that's my perspective. I mean, let's be clear, this is, this is true of law, of national laws as well as universal or international human rights. Uh, and yes, it's, it's absolutely possible, but so far at least, you haven't gotten a lot of international human rights courts ruling that uh, in favor of folks who are challenging these, uh, these well-established rights. You don't have the, the movements are not mass movements, after all, uh, at least so far uh, in, in Europe, um, Orban is, doesn't have a huge number of other countries other than maybe Poland falling uh, into, uh, into line behind him. So yes, it's true, it could happen theoretically, and we may go through a very, very dark period of history. That's absolutely true, but, um, so far that hasn't been the case. And I don't think the fact that it could happen is a sufficient argument against constructivism unless you can offer a reason to believe that a position that affirms another alternative grounding in rights like natural law would somehow prevent that from happening. And I don't think that can, I don't think you can make that argument. No, I think that's right. There's no way that um, natural law can prevent anything from happening any more than true science can prevent people from be believing in pseudoscience, right? I mean, the truth doesn't reach out and grab people by the throat in that kind of way. But I think that the question that um, the more natural law inclined people would be wanting to press is, is that consideration, the consideration of shifting consensus, what this matter really turns on? And and that's why I think Sam was right to press you on, on if you're going to be a constructivist, then you've got, to, you've got to accept that this is what it turns on. It turns on whether there is this consensus. And, 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 the other, and, and, and your opponent is basically saying, look, whether women have a right not to be discriminated against doesn't depend on how many people in the world agree with that. But John, natural law depends upon consensus too. I mean, when John Locke said that people without property or that women were not entitled to the uh, same 
number of rights or degree or kind of rights, that was based on a consensus at that point. And, and that eventually was rejected because a consensus uh, uh, rejected that. So natural law or divine intervention, divine law, all of it is ultimately based upon human consensus. Yeah, no, I, I agree that there's a level at which we're talking about um, what people believe and what large groups of people believe. But then the question is, on what grounds do they believe it? So are we just going to say one form of consensus gave way to another form of consensus? Or are we to say something like, people shifted away from their sexist consensus because they came to grasp the truth that women have a whole range of capabilities that make them equal to men, which is the explanation. I think, I think the latter is true. And, and uh, there was a gradually evolving improvement in our understanding of what human dignity requires. And right. some of that was based on facts. Yes, that women do have equal capabilities. And some of it was based on how, what those facts informed, which was changes in norms. And this is how all social change takes place, is that you have first a change in understanding of fundamental facts, and gradually you have a change in norms, which leads to a change in laws, which leads to more change in norms, etc. Let me now take you to final question from the audience. What could be some challenges of transferring or upholding rights within the real world into the virtual realm? Um, especially given emerging technologies and the recent hype around the metaverse. And this is from Selene Akalan McGee. So rights in virtual reality. I'm gonna mute myself so someone else will have to answer that. Well, I think that's a huge question uh, that is probably worthy of a future colloquium. <laughs> and I, I will say that, uh, you know, one, one impression I have is that, um, you know, if you look at Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International that actually have programs on digital technologies, as well as programs at places like UC Berkeley and Oxford and so on. But the vast majority of organizations that are uh, you know, struggling on various human rights issues on the ground level um, are really grappling with the here and now issues. And so the question then becomes, how do we do that, but then also look to the future? And in many cases, um, we are talking about the issues in the news, like the issues of Facebook and the metaverse or, um, you know, Google, et cetera. And then in many cases, it's information that perhaps is hidden to us, unknown to us, or is really emerging on the horizon in a decade or two. And so it is incumbent upon us to always think about uh, this conversation about the rights landscape as dynamic and ever evolving. Of course, according to David Chalmers, we may actually be in a virtual simulation. So it could be a here and now point for him. Um, I'm gonna give the two commentators a chance to come back on any points that they would like to before we wrap up. No? Oh, okay, that's remarkable. So let me just then end by thanking everyone, our two um, main speakers, Sushma and Bill, for that uh, really invigorating discussion. I do think in all sorts of ways, this idea of how we properly understand the new rights that we should countenance in the era of digital technology is really quite an important one. And you've given us a real framework for thinking about that and help bring out all the issues. So, um, um, great thanks to both of you and thank you to our two commentators and a special thanks to Sam who stepped in to replace um, Carissa Valiz who was going to be the other commentator. So thanks a lot, Sam. And thank you to everyone for, for watching us and participating today. Thanks a lot. Good night.